Welcome to the WhitmerCast, a podcast by the John Whitmer Historical Association. We bring you essays, interviews, panel discussions, and broadcasts related to Mormon history and restoration studies. My name is Makoto Hunter. I use the pronouns she and her. Currently, I'm a graduate student in American history at the University of California, Santa Barbara, and I'll be your host for today's episode. Thanks for tuning in. We have a really good episode lined up for you. We'll be talking to Benjamin E. Park. If you'd like to join the John Whitmer Historical Association or visit our entire backlog of episodes and journals, go to jwha.info. With that out of the way, let's get started. Today, I have the pleasure of being joined by Benjamin E. Park. He is an associate professor of history at Sam Houston State University, studying the intersections of politics, culture, and religion in the history of the United States, especially within the 18th and 19th centuries and in Atlantic contexts. He's the author of numerous excellent articles, chapters, and books, including American Nationalisms, Imagining Union in the Age of Revolutions, published by Cambridge University Press in 2018, and Kingdom of Nauvoo, The Rise and Fall of a Religious Empire on the American Frontier, published by LiveRight, an imprint of W.W. Norton in 2020. He is a co-editor for the Mormon Studies Review Journal and has edited two volumes of collected articles, the 2021 Companion to American Religious History, and DNA Mormon, Perspectives on the Legacy of D. Michael Quinn, published by Signature Books in 2022. Today, we will talk with him about the work he does in American history and Mormon studies and about his forthcoming book, American Zion, A New History of Mormonism, to be published by Live Right at the beginning of 2024. In his off time, Ben loves hiking, lifts weights, plays disc golf, and listens to far too many audiobooks. Uh, but don't we all? Ben, thank you so much for joining us and for and for this opportunity to, to learn about your research and to preview your forthcoming work. It's a true honor to be here. Thanks for hosting me. All right. I'm very excited to talk to you about the intersection of Mormon studies and U.S. history and about American Zion. But first, it'd be great to have some background. Um, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, I uh, have been teaching here at Sam Houston State for uh, seven years. Um, I'm currently the director of graduate studies. Uh, I was born in Idaho, uh, raised mostly in New Mexico. I received my uh, undergraduate education at Brigham Young University, uh, where I majored in both English and history. And then I went overseas for my graduate studies, uh, doing a master's degree in theology at the University of Edinburgh, then a, a second master's degree this time in politics at the University of Cambridge. And then I finished uh, my PhD in history at the University of Cambridge. Um, I've always had an interest in Mormon history. And in fact, my first academic presentation was at the John Whitmer Historical Association Conference in 2007 in Kirtland. What a, what a great beginning then. Uh, Kirtland, a great environment. And great to hear that the JWHA was a good setting for you. Thanks for telling us a bit about yourself and, and sort of the background to your, to your career and these excellent publications that you've, that you've had. Why don't we jump right in? So you work broadly, your work broadly covers U.S. political history. And you've told us about some of uh, the training that goes into that, trained in theology and in politics. You work especially in the early republic. So what draws you to incorporate the history of Latter-day Saints into that work? And how do you go about doing so? And what is the place of work such as American Zion and Kingdom of Nauvoo in your work and in that field? What kind of audiences do you, do you hope that this kind of intersection might reach? That's a great question. When I decided to jump in uh, to history, I had concluded I wasn't going to look at Mormonism. I, I wanted to do something else. I wanted to follow what, what you might call the Richard Bushman model, right? Become an expert in other topics and maybe in, your, in the twilight of your career, come back and, and do work on Mormonism. And so I wrote my first book on American nationalism's conceptions of uh, America during the nation's first five decades. And I ended that book in 1832. So Mormons barely arrive at that time, and they don't play any role. And then I set off to write my next project, which was going to be religion and the abolition movement. And then in 2016, the Latter-day Saint Church released uh, the long sequestered minutes of the Council of Fifty. And since I had background in Mormon history, I was a research assistant for the Joseph Smith Papers Project when I was an undergraduate student. So I had some connections, and I was now a, an, an expert on religion and politics. 
the church approached me about reviewing pre-publication volume of those minutes. And when I read through those minutes, I realized that there was such a potent expression of democratic discontent, a, a key theme of my broader scholarship, that I'm like, there, there's a history to be written here. And so almost begrudgingly, I was pulled into writing a book on Mormonism. And I decided if I was going to write this book, I wanted to write it for a broader audience, because a lot of people, those who attend JWHA, are, you know, somewhat aware with uh, the Council of 50 or Joseph Smith. But Nauvoo, if if it's anything to the broader audience, it's a quixotic oddity. It's something that's kind of weird. It's, you know, this weird pilgrimage destination for the Mormons, but it doesn't mean anything to American history in their eyes. And so I took it as a challenge to write a book that resulted in Kingdom of Nauvoo that try to look at Nauvoo as a moment of democratic crisis, um, something that is both a fascinating story in its own right, but something that can tell us a lot about broader American history. And so that's why I ended up going with the trade press. Uh, Live Right is an imprint of W.W. Uh, w. Norton, so they're one of the big uh, New York publishing firms. Um, I wanted a book that could be sold in uh, in airport bookstores, which I'm, I'm, I'm glad it is. And I, because because I truly believe that Mormonism is a core part of America's religious history, and more people need to know about it. And and when I finished Kingdom of Nauvoo, I thought that was it. I'm not going to do much more on Mormon history. I'm going to go back to my religion abolition book. And then the press approached me about, hey, what would you think about doing a general history of Mormonism in America? Um, at first, I thought no for a number uh, of reasons, and then the pandemic hit. And then I wasn't able to do the, the archival research that I needed for other projects. And I realized that I already had a research base and a historiographical founding. And so I set off to write this general survey of Mormonism. But like Kingdom Nauvoo, I wanted to frame it in a way that it would not only make sense to, but seem significant to non-Mormons, those who might not even know about Mormonism, to convince them that this is a tradition that's worth uh, understanding. Thanks for that great introduction, for, for laying that out so well. Um, and, King, with King, and Kingdom of Nauvoo really does so successfully place Nauvoo, not just within a Mormon context, but on an American stage. Really grateful to, as, 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 uh, as unfortunate as that you did not get to pursue your other research, I confess I'm glad that sort of this contingency has given us the opportunity to have your, to have your broader sense of the wide arc of Mormon history within the American experience. But speaking of sort of single volume and broad histories of, of the Latter-day Saint tradition, and since the 1970s, there have been several academically rigorous single volume histories of such. Uh, but to my understanding, American Zion is going to be the first printed with a major publisher in about 12 years. Um, and so where do you see American Zion coming in in relation to those previous books? What are you hoping to build upon? What are you looking to bring to the table that will be particularly novel, useful, maybe underdeveloped elsewhere, or just wanting to develop in a different way? Are there ways in which the history is organized, interpreted, or narrated differently from previous studies that we can look forward to? Yeah, those are wonderful questions. And these are definitely the questions that haunted me over these last uh, four years as I've been uh, working, three years as I've been working on this project. Because there's a lot of really good books on Mormonism, both in general and specific. So it is a fool's quest uh, to try to uh, write a book that synthesizes so much great scholarship. I could point to a few wonderful examples. Glenn Leonard and James Allen, uh, their Latter-day Saint experience is, in my mind, still one of the best social histories of the church ever written, and, and one of the best books on the 20th century. And it's it's absolutely wonderful. But it is, you know, explicitly devotional. It's meant to be written with a devotional bent. It was published by Deseret Book in, in 1976. More recently, we have Matthew Bowman's phenomenal The Mormon People, which was an absolute Herculean task that he wrote that over like six weeks or something. We always joke that that's the uh, that's the experience that proves the lie to the apologetic argument that Joe Smith couldn't write the Book of Mormon in as short a period as he does because no one can write as uh, well. Matt Matt Bowman uh, matched that with his wonderful history. So I try to find ways to make my book different. Any book is going to be different based on the author and what questions they bring to the tale. 
Um, now, there's a few things that I have at my advantage. Uh, the last decade has been a an explosion of wonderful scholarship in Mormon studies that I've been able to synthesize, especially scholarship on the 20th century of Mormonism. And so we have a much better perspective of 20th century Mormonism now than we did a decade ago. Second, we have a lot of primary sources that are available now that weren't available before. Uh, not just, you know, Joseph Haber's project, but we have the David O. McKay diaries. We have, you know, lots of Spencer W. Kimball diaries that just came out. We have so much uh, great material. We also have so much great scholarship material related to LDS women's history, whether it be all the Eliza R. Snow stuff, the Emmeline B. Wells material that the LDS church has put out, the Relief Society minutes that have been put out in, in the last couple of years. I mean, these are sources that can really help us dig into uh, stories that had been overlooked before. I also wanted to uh, place, uh, give a historical background to a number of themes that I find most interesting. And when I was trying to decide which topics I was going to emphasize in my book, because you can't emphasize everything in Mormon history over a span of 200 years for just, you know, 400 pages, um, I decided I want to explain the story of how Mormons came to be culturally conservative, politically Republican, um, and socially diverse. Um, what led, uh, I wanted to emphasize the diversity within the Mormon experience. I wanted to show the long and quixotic journey that led to Mormons becoming one of the most reliant of uh, Republican voting blocs in, in America. And I wanted to show what, what are the precise moments that led the church to be conservative on a lot of social and cultural issues. And so I tried to give historical genealogies on those three points. And last and finally, you can tell I give this a lot of thought because this gives me a lot of anxiety of proving why this book is important. My overall theme that I feel I'm showing in this book is that Mormonism has been produced by a series of cultural clashes over 200 years, that it wasn't a straight and determined, predetermined trajectory that, that led Mormonism from one point to another, but there are lots of shifts and turns, there were avenues uh, left untraveled, there were people whose voices went unheralded, and there was agitation both in the center and in the margins that shaped Mormonism. And so I put a lot of emphasis on showing how maybe marginalized voices have shaped a lot of the Mormon experience, whether it be African American and Native American experiences in the in the 19th century, um, LGBTQ voices in the 21st, and then all the other different types of voices in between. Thanks for that really great rundown. I hope it's all right. There's, there's so much good material here. I want to circle back and kind of probe a little bit further some of what some of what you've said. But also to add that you've, I've been excited about American science for a while now, but I'm just even more excited. I can't, uh, because, and I think I, I love the way that the themes you're pursuing, I think they speak a lot to the themes that are important to the fields of Mormon studies and American history. Uh, but before getting back to that, I want to kind of circle to something, to some of the things you brought up earlier. You mentioned right the profusion of scholarship in the last ten years. It's it's uh, it's incredible. It's it's wonderful how generative the field remains, uh, but also the wider access to various art, various archival materials. What kind of um, balance do you seek to achieve? Or, if I may ask, what guided your decisions about where to draw upon existing scholarship, where to work with and synthesize what others have done, and where you wanted to bring in your own primary research, uh, what questions you wanted to investigate, and how you made those kinds of decisions and moves? It's a, it's a great question, um, and, it, and it's something that really drove a lot of my thinking and framing of this book. I tried to have, in every chapter, I had to have a core of key figures, of, of key individuals kind of flesh out the story, right? Because I want this to be a story with flesh and blood, something where you can see human beings um, enacting these policies or ideas or confronting these crises. And so every chapter, I tried to zero in whose perspectives can really be drawn out. Some were determined from the very start because I knew they were going to be fascinating. When I deal with the 1870s and 1880s period, 
I drew extensively from the George Q. Cannon diaries because those were just released in the last few years. And those are some of the most phenomenally revealing sources of Mormon history because George Q. Cannon was arguably the most powerful or most prominent Mormon in the, in the 19th century, perhaps even beyond Joe Smith and Brigham Young when it comes to political capital and cultural influence. And we finally have his diaries. And so that chapter is dominated by like trying to tell the story of, of him because he's going back and forth between Washington, D.C. and Salt Lake City. And so you're able to get this wonderful perspective. At the same time, that same chapter, I'm digging into these diaries that were kept by Mormon men and women who went on the underground or were, you know, hiding from federal officials when the government is prosecuting polygamy in the 1880s. In the chapter before that, where I'm doing the, the 1850s and 1860s, I just very happily and, and accidentally uh, encountered a woman by the name of Phoebe Woodbury, who uh, travels, she's elder, she's a middle-aged woman who travels to Utah in 1851. And then her Adult children are living back in the in the East, and she starts this long correspondence with them, a two-decade-long correspondence where she's detailing life in Utah. And so I tell a lot of these stories in Utah, whether it be the Utah War, Mount Meadows Massacre, the Civil War, through the perspective of this woman who I had never heard her name before. But I thought these very rich letters give a perspective of what life was like um, on the ground. Um, at the same time, in the 20th century, there's a number of sources that are, are quite revealing. Uh, Leonard Arrington, who, of course, is the father of New Mormon history, his diaries were just released a few years ago by Signature Books in a wonderful edited volume by Gary Bergera, where we learn that Leonard Arrington was a social butterfly in the church office building who picks up every piece of gossip that's going around. And so you're able to capture this, this wonderful perspective of LDS institutional culture during the 1970s and early 1980s through those diaries. So I try to have a balance of, I want to prove the broader context is important to Mormonism. I try to understand, like, this is how the Great Depression is playing out in Utah, or this is how the culture wars are playing out in Utah. But I try to balance that with a cast of characters who make it real, who make it uh, uh, relatable. And so you'll see both trying to synth synthesize broader historiographical concerns, but told through the story of of you know characters with uh one of my favorite i know I, i'm going on and on but one of my favorite moments is is discussing the rise and fall of amy brown lyman who was a relief society leader in the early 20th century and i mark her rise and fall in leadership is also the rise and fall of mormon modernism and i define what modernism means in that sense and so trying to understand these broader mormon stories through perspectives that sometimes are overlooked Gosh, that was just very exciting. It is exciting. Um, I love how you are, how you are both balancing the sort of these wider contexts, these big, these big social forces with sort of individual humans who put flesh and that's a great phrase, putting flesh and blood on the history. That these things don't happen spontaneously; they happen, they're enacted through people. Uh, but simultaneously, within that balancing, both these very uh, significant highly influential, highly interconnected individuals like, like Lyman and Cannon, uh, and yet also Phoebe Woodbury, this very, you know, we might say very ordinary kind of his, uh, from the from uh, bottom up approach, seeing expanding and fleshing out our perspectives. So thank you for, for expanding on that. I wanted to probe if there was anything further you wanted to say about the, you mentioned this, this decade of an explosion of wonderful scholarship in Mormon studies. You touched on our improved perspective on the 20th century. Kind of, there's a lot. There's been a lot of gr really good work in in women's history. Is there anything else you would want to to expand on there? Uh, ways in which the changing historiography creates an important context for a new single volume study. Yeah, I'll highlight two important books on the 20th century that have come out in the last few years. Uh, Colleen McDonald's Sister Saints, which examines Mormon women since the end of polygamy, is, I'd argue, one of the most important books on Mormon history yet written because it it overviews um, how Mormon women experience religion and transform religion. And in a way that makes it relevant to broader scholars because it shows how women are dealing with modern issues that all American women are dealing with. 
And so that's a wonderful book that is really at, at, at the heart of understanding modern Mormonism. And the other is Taylor Petrie's book, Tabernacles of Clay, uh, where he demonstrates that Mormonism's uh, views on gender uh, have transformed quite uh, substantially over the last five decades in ways that might be surprising to those who aren't experts in the field, that it was far from determined that the modern Mo Mormon sense of eternal genders was ingrained, but that those evolved and that they were in response to a number of cultural tensions in broader America. And so those are two examples of recent books that have really shaped how historians view modern Mormonism and that I've tried to incorporate into my own work. Thank you. One last circling back on this theme of kind of what American Zion is bringing in. You, you've already kind of hinted at and touched on if there's anything else you want to comment on with the way the book is organized. It sounds like this is a chronological history. To some degree, there's an important role that narrative plays. Is there anything in particular you would want to say about kind of the reasons for the, this, this genre, this format, this approach to telling the history? Yeah, I wanted to, since I'm a historian, I wanted to do it chronologically. There, there was no part of me that wanted to do just a thematic history. I also wanted, I at first I thought to do it chronologically, but each chapter dealing with a different theme. Um, and maybe, you know, this is going to be the chapter where I deal with gender, or this is a chapter where I'm going to deal with race, or this is a chapter where I'm going to deal with issues of of dissent and authority. In the end, I decided against that route, and I wanted to integrate those themes within each chapter, because I decided that one of the core arguments of this book, of this book is that Mormonism is culturally contingent, and it's based on a number of pivot points. And so I try to show, and I think those pivot points can only be understood within this strict chronological narrative. So each chapter covers between 20 and 30 years, each chapter will have this cast of characters. Some characters have a multiple chapter arc. Others rise and fall within a, a, a subsection. There are 10 chapters in total. Each chapter has about 10 subsections. And each of these subsections, you know, move the story along chronologically while engaging these different facets of Mormonism at the time. And so I thought that structure is what's going to emphasize the best, the sense of the, the developing, unfolding nature of the Mormon experience. Thanks for the explanation. And I really appreciate that emphasis you placed, right, that this, that this structure helps emphasize the argument, the cultural contingency of you know, of subcultures, of, of religions, and what that's, and, and the kind of, the contribution that's making to cultural contingency within U.S. history as well. You know, it's not, we can't just go back to antediluvian origins and say, aha, that's where it started and thus it ever was. No, that had to be sustained or transformed over time. Next, if I may probe another theme, something that you have been, your work has done, been really good with has been placing Mormon studies within the wider field of American history, and also indicating not only how the U.S. context is part of the contingency and shaping of the Latter-day Saint tradition, but also how, you know, there's, there's a dialogue, you know, there's mutual shaping that takes place. With that in mind, I, I wondered if there was anything Part in this collecting thoughts, I'm thinking about key themes and developments in the current historiography of the United of the United States history and of Mormon studies. There's been big moves to sort of think about transnational subjects, to think about global topics, the way sort of so not only how Mormonism in America interact, but how that interacts with the world. Um, so I'm wondering if you would speak to how histories like Kingdom of Nauvoo uh, previously, or or perhaps more more directly how American Zion nevertheless invite our attention, nevertheless ask us to think there is a global history at play, but there's also sort of an important American context at play. And whether in addition to that, if there are transnational elements we should anticipate or look forward to. Yeah, it's a great question. It's probably one of the most pressing issues when dealing with Mormon history is coming to grips with the international context. Uh, as my wonderful scholarly friends like Melissa Inoue and others will quickly tell me, you can't understand Mormonism without understanding the global context, especially the, the modern church. 
when I wrote this book, I was tempted, and there are some people who said, you know, you have to write it as a global history. Um, I decided against that for, for two reasons. One, a wonderful scholar, one of the best scholars in the field, uh, Lori Mathley Kipp, is already writing a global history of Mormonism, which is going to be the definitive uh, a book on that topic. So I'm, I'm leaving the more difficult project to, to her because she's brilliant enough to do it. And two, I'm a historian of American religion. Uh, that that that's what I c come down to. I'm not I'm not a historian of Mormonism who's also interested in religion. I'm a historian of American religion, and so I'm going to use Mormonism to understand American religion, and which is why my book is focused on uh, the United States. That said, I agree you can't understand Mormonism without its global contours. So I try to show how the international presence is going to shape the modern church. To give one example of that, in the book, I, uh, I demonstrate how Mormon questions of missionary work in Africa in the 1950s and 1960s end up influencing how the church deals with civil rights issues back home. And so on the one hand, the civil rights movement, that's an American story, right? We're just looking at, at Americans doing it. But, but I show that in the Mormon context, you can't understand that unless you're understanding how they're dealing with their issue of lots of potential converts in Africa. So that's one point where I try to show that the global studies has to be intertwined. Another example I give is when Mormons are debating politics and how much American politics can, can influence American doctrine and practice. In the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s, there's a very conscious moment when church leaders decide, hey, Maybe we shouldn't let Ezra have Benson go out and speak against communism when we have a lot of saints who live in communist nations. And they end up, you know, telling church leaders, you need to leave American politics behind because that's keeping us too parochial. So I think this global context is crucial to understanding Mormonism. Um, that said, I think that's my second that said in this very answer. But that said, I still think the American context has proven the most influential on the Latter-day Saint Church. As global as church leadership has become, as global as church membership has definitely become, much of the, the institution is still tethered to both a cultural practice or tradition that's rooted in the United States, as well as responding to issues taking place in the United States. So I think there has to be a balance here. We have to recognize the global context, and we also have to recognize how America is still, you know, a, a, a key part of it. So I'm doing the cop-out attempt of just, you know, telling the American story, and I'm leaving it to, uh, you know, more gifted scholars who are versed in global history, like Lori Mathley Kipp, like Melissa Inouye, like Caroline Klein, who are doing phenomenal work, and, and they're going to do much more that will transform our understanding of Mormonism through the global context. Thank you for that really illuminating answer. I appreciate the the sort of the glimpse we get of how the book is going to be balancing some of this, how it is, right, there is a field of American religious history uh, and of U.S. history that, you know, continues to exist that remains relevant, right, that there's both these global for global factors, but also local factors, and the interplay of that is really fascinating. I wonder, would it be right accurate at all to sort of get the impression that this is part of your sort of this this speaks to your the, your sort of three-pronged themes kind of thinking about how this tradition the latter-day saints become culturally conservative politically republican and also uh socially diverse and how that those elements of like the, re the republican reliability and the conservative politics that that is sort of a place where institutionally kind of American American placement is very important. And yet socially diverse speaks to both sort of US themes and the way in which global themes kind of redound back. Yeah, no, absolutely. I think it's a dialogue going on. I think there, there's both an, a, a cultural context in America that is inescapable for the Latter-day Saint Church and its leaders, but there's also this gravitational pull toward, you know, with, we're a few decades away from a majority of uh, um, active Latter-day Saints being in non-English speaking nations. And I mean, we're already at the point where a majority of Latter-day Saints are outside the United States. So I think there's gonna be a constant uh, dialogue. I, I, I don't know how it's gonna turn out. Historians prove to be horrible prophets. 
Um, and so I, I think that finding that balance is something that the church has proven to be a bit conservative in moving toward, right? Institution, institutional wheels turn slowly. And so, but, but I think they are turning and we're going to see more of that turn going forward. And that itself seems to uh, illuminate really interesting things about sort of the United States as a nation's its own transformation very broadly, demographically and politically, and sort of its history, both domestically and globally. Yeah, absolutely. I think, and that's one of the, the key parts of my book is I try to show that learning the stu- this history of Mormonism is learning the story of America because the American story can be told through the lens of the Mormon experience. Thank you, very illuminating. So. Uh, American Zion is coming out at the beginning of 2024. And thank you so much for giving us this uh, this advanced sort of preview of much of its themes. I'm hoping that all who are listening will be very excited to get that book once it comes out. I know we just talked about how m- many of us are historians, that we're not necessarily uh, fortune tellers or prophets, but nevertheless, we have hopes. And so after the book's publication next year and over the next several years, what do you hope will be the legacy of American Zion in its reception, in both the, in the historiography and among wider audiences? What primary takeaways do you think or would like to see circulate? Well, I'm hoping that people will read this book and recognize uh, the cultural diversity within Mormonism. I'm hoping they'll see that there's no one stereotype of what the Mormon experience was. I hope they also read the book and recognize that American religion has been culturally contingent, just like Mormonism, that America wasn't you know, predetermined to end up the way it is now, where religiosity is mostly contained it, or in the public sphere to this conservative movement, that there have been, you know, a wide variety of religious movements uh, in the nation, as you can see through the Mormon example, yada, yada, yada. I also hope that people can take from this that Mormonism and maybe other conservative religions as well, because they have changed in the past, they might change in the future, that we are in no place to, you know, be 100% certain where these traditions are going to end up. One of the things, uh, one of the key arguments in my book is that Mormonism has proven so powerful because they have proven adept to change while still framing those changes within the context of eternal infallibility, right? This idea that we are grasping for these eternal truths that are the only firm bedrock you can find in a world of change, and that when changes are made, they're quickly explained within the context of an unchanging church. And so I hope readers will recognize that Mormonism is part and parcel of the American experience, that when I do you know, a tweet out about Mormonism, there'll be fewer replies from people saying, oh, that's just a cult based on nonsense. I'm hoping people will be able to you know, see, okay, this is a... Uh, this is a tradition that can reveal a lot about the human experience, even if they're not going to come down to, you know, conclude that even if they don't conclude that Mormonism is a viable religion, I think they, I I hope they can come down and see how Mormonism has been um, seen as viable by, you know, millions of people in the past. Thank you. And I think from, and from what you've shared here, I think that, that your book will succeed at that. Uh, And so I'm just very, very excited to see it coming out. I just, I only, I only wish it wasn't so far away. <laughs> but, but, but congratulations on that. Th- thanks very much for all this time. We've talked, covered several different themes, but I'm curious: is there any subject uh, we have not broached that you would like to touch upon, whether in American Zion specifically, your work more broadly, or something else you would like to say to the Whitmer cast? Yeah, I'm going to take a time to do a confessional to the Whitmer cast because, you know, given JWHA's excellent history and tradition of looking at, you know, the variety of Mormon experiences, whether it be uh, the reorganized tradition or fundamentalists or the Cutlerites or, of course, the Latter-day Saints, one of the things that I wanted American Zion to be is to show this full, you know, smorgasbord of Mormon options in the past. And so I tried to show the fights between LDS and RLDS 
uh, missionaries in the 1860s. I show the rise of fundamentalism in the early 20th century. I discuss how Mormon, how LDS and RLDS missions to Africa in the 1950s demonstrate the diverging trajectories of those two traditions. I talk about um, RLDS and LDS debates over women's ordination and gender rights in the 1980s. And so I, I really try to demonstrate the diversity of the Mormon, um, the diversity of uh, the Mormon umbrella, but probably not as much as I should have. I, I wish I would have been able to make it a bigger theme. That was sadly one of the things that when I first wrote this book, um, it was twice as long as the published version is going to be. Uh, my first, e each of my 10 chapters uh, came in about 15,000 words. Each of the first drafts of those chapters were near 30,000 words. So I had to cut out a lot. And sadly, a lot of the things I had to cut out were more of the, uh, you know, a section on RLDS peace uh, movements in the 19 teens based on the wonderful work of Lachlan Mackay and others. And so um, I hope this book is a step forward in general syntheses on Mormonism as it comes to in, uh, incorporating non-LDS Mormon voices uh, within the Mormon diaspora, but we still have a lot more to go. And I look forward to the brilliant historian in the future who's going to do that even better. Thank you. Really, really great to bring up. And so what, a, what a perfect question that came from, from you, our interviewee. I am curious, you've mentioned sort of ho hoping to see further, further developments in these integrations of various denominations of, the Mor of Mormonisms. Perhaps it's not fair to ask you about other people's work, but do you know at all whether, whether say, the Mathley Kipps upcoming work does that integration or whether there's, or what and where we should look to uh, beyond JWHA uh, and its journal, of course, we should look here for some of that work. But where else might we see this happening? Yeah, so I, I know uh, Lori Mathelikip has been interested in these divergent expressions. I remember attending JWHA with her for a few times. I have no idea how much she's dealing with that in her book. Of course, I'm sure all listeners of this podcast know of the wonderful encyclopedic work of Stephen Shields on the the, the Mormon diaspora. But there, there still has not been a huge, a big synthesis book on the Mormon diverging expressions. There are some wonderful edited collections, uh, The Scattering of the Saints that John Hamer and a few others put together. I guess it's been over a decade and a half ago now, uh, which is crazy. Chris, Christine, and Chris Blythe, Christine Blythe, and and uh, Jay, I, I'm forgetting Jay's last name, put together a wonderful book on divergent Mormon scripture last year with the University of Utah Press. That was phenomenal. But I'm, I'm looking forward to the scholar who's going to write the book on the Mormon diaspora, because that, that's that's truly one of the books that are needed. Yeah, and now that you've said it, I, 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 I see the need. And I, I hope that all Whitmer Cast listeners hear that call. And I hope that we see that there. We have been really fortunate to see the development of all sorts of great studies of various denominations, right? Here we have a, uh, a new one for Latter-day Saints, where probably many who listen to the Schur Whitmer cast are familiar with Mark Schur's work on community of Christ. And we've been seeing great, great developments in all sorts of work, but, as, but as an integration and synthesis of the whole diaspora. May we, uh, may we see that soon, I hope. Yeah. Um, as we wrap up, just some final questions. Are there any collaborators or, or individuals who you'd like to especially acknowledge or thank before we let you go? Sure. Um, well, John Whitmer Historical Association has always been a wonderful home for scholarship. I've been able to present a, a, maybe a half dozen times, and each each time has been lovely. The The community is is just phenomenal. Uh, Mormon History Association uh, has been, you know, a, a foundational uh, community for me, and I, I've been very privileged to both serve in very variety of roles there. Over the last uh, 10 years, I've been involved with the Mormon Studies Review, uh, both as a as a um, associate editor for six years and now as a co-editor for the last few years. And my partner in crime, Quitney, 
Quincy Newell is uh, one of the best scholars in the field and being able to assess the Mormon studies field with her has been a vantage point that and a privilege that a few people get to experience. So, so that has been great. Um, during the pandemic years, it was sometimes hard to travel and research. So I was very fortunate that uh, uh, the wonderful historian artist Partial uh, helped me out a couple of times and doing research when I couldn't. Um, and so she, she, was, she was a big help. But uh, Mormon history truly is a community. And uh, it really is an army of scholars uh, working together. And I, one of my biggest fears in this book is because of the word count, I wasn't able to cite, like I could have cited two pages worth of sources for each footnote, but word count doesn't allow me to do that, right? So I'm only hoping, and this is what I wrote in the acknowledgement, I'm only hoping that the Mormon history community is as forgiving as they are brilliant, uh, because it's truly only on the shoulders of all these giants that new scholarship is able to be done. Thank you for that. And I, I, I certainly hope so as well, because and that we'll, we'll to see in the footnotes and recognize everything that that you wanted to be there and to, and, to, and, to, and to see in the text everything that is there. Thank, so thank you for, for that expression. Um, as we close, if, you, if people want to get in touch, uh, where can they find you? Where would you like to be uh, contacted or, or, or I, seen? I'm way too active online. Uh, my Twitter account and uh, is uh, Benjamin E. Park. And as long as the Twitter uh, system is still up and running, which maybe it won't be by the time this podcast comes out, given the way Twitter is nowadays, um, that people can find me there. I've also become increasingly active on TikTok, doing a series of videos on a variety of topics, especially uh, related to my forthcoming book. That's also Benjamin E. Park. Um, and then you can find my website, which is benjamineepark.com. And that always has links to any of my online writings, any news, and also host the schedule of my lecture tour when that comes. Thanks so much. You've been so gracious with your time. Uh, and we really, we really appreciate it. Best wishes as, uh, as American Zion's publication date comes ever closer. And we'll look forward to both that book. And hopefully listeners can see that lecture tour coming near them. It's been a true pl privilege. Once again, we'd like to thank Ben Park for joining us today and lending his voice and expertise to this growing field of Mormon studies. You can find him at Benjamin E. Park on Twitter or at Benjamin E. Park on TikTok. Also look at BenjaminEPark.com for a schedule of the lecture tour when that happens, a list of his publications and his other work. Kingdom of Nauvoo can be found where books are sold and American Zion will be published by LiveWrite at the beginning of 2024. And you'll find links to everything in the show notes. We want to thank you for tuning in to the WhitmerCast. John Whitmer Historical Association is an educational nonprofit institution. For more information, visit www.jwha.info, where you can meet our team and join the association, read past issues of the JWHA Journal, and get updates on upcoming conferences and events. Our theme music is I Love to Tell the Story, composed by Tom Moraine. This podcast is a production of John Whitmer Historical Association, all rights reserved.